Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Opta Live webinar series. We're very pleased to start this member service again, having done it during COVID, and uh, we are back by popular demand. We want to thank Portland Fuels for uh, stepping up to offer this to Opta members, uh, and we're thankful that you've joined us this morning. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, host this morning, Robel Hale. Uh, at the end of Robel's presentation, we're going to have a Q&A uh, because we have such a uh, an intimate group this morning. It gives us the opportunity to really get into some things. So we hope you take advantage of that either in the chat or um, or you can unmute yourself and, and we can do it that way. But with that introduction, Robel, thank you again. I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's having a good morning. I think it's Karen has introduced me already. My name is Robel Hiley. I'm working with Portland Fuel. It's been uh, coming to the end of my first year with Portland Fuel, and I'm very happy to share what I've learned and share how we can find some boisterous certainty around fuel prices. So today's main topic will be how can transit operators and municipalities control the fuel budgets and find a measure of protection from these rising fuel prices. So if we look at the next slide here, some of the agenda, I'll give you a quick intro to who we are, what we do with Portland. I'll pull back the curtain on how your diesel prices built up. We'll look at some of the main price drivers the past three years. Uh, we'll look at what may drive prices um, next year. And we look at what can be done to stabilize and protect yourself from these, from these price fluctuations. We'll look at hedging as a strategy. We'll look at why you should hedge. And we're going to open the floor up to questions and ha hopefully have a fruitful discussion where by the end of it, we've learned how fuel is priced and what we can do to protect ourselves from all this volatility in the market. So Portland Fuel, we're, we commenced operations in the UK in 2009, and we started out as a specialist hedging provider, uh, providing budgetary certainty to organizations who were exposed to movements of fuel prices. In the past 14 years since we started, we've grown exponentially. And now we have offices across Europe and North America. We have a presence here in Canada. We have, we've been in Canada now for uh, almost a decade, since 2014. We, in addition to our diesel protection service, we also offer a, a consultancy where we can consult you and how to decarbonize your operations, as well as look at how you can get the best bang for your buck in negotiating with fuel suppliers. So we've grown not only as a hedging provider, but also as a uh, consultancy. We've had a presence since 2014 in Canada. We worked with various municipalities, transit operators, fuel distributors, and all years, uh, giving them complete budgetary certainty over their diesel spend, the gasoline and other fuel grades as well. So we, we're going to look at and pull back the curtain on how diesel was priced um, across Canada, but Toronto in particular. So if you look at the following slide here, we have all these components that make up your, your pump price, your, your wholesale rack price. Um, the first two will be the ones we'll be focusing on as they are the most volatile and they make up the bulk, the bulk of the price. The others are mainly uh, fuel supplier margins and your various taxes. Uh, we cannot protect or do anything about taxes, as they say, the only thing is assured in life are death and taxes. So that's beyond our control. But we can take a look at the New York Harbor price component, as well as the freight premium. So New York Harbor is one of the largest diesel markets in North America, created in New York. And it is the, uh, the basis on which every liter of diesel in North America is priced. It is uh, traded very frequently and it's very sensitive to any movements in geopolitics, any geopolitical events affect that price as well, the New York Harbor price, um, which I'll elaborate further in this presentation, as well as supply and demand considerations, which we'll look at as well. Then we have the second component, which is very important, is called the freight premium. Now, the freight premium in Canada can range anywhere from five cents to above 30 cents. And it is primarily determined by how far you are from what I'd call a primary terminal. Now, a primary terminal is a location where refineries send their products, their distillate, their diesel, gasoline, 
uh, via pipeline to be picked up by various fuel marketers and fuel wholesalers. Now, as pipeline is the cheapest form of transporting diesel, it stands to reason that anytime fuels transported in this way by pipeline, it will be the cheapest way of uh, acquiring fuel. Um, many refineries send their, uh, they build these refining terminals close to major population centers uh, like Toronto, Hamilton, um, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, cities of that size. And once you go further, further uh, out into the more rural communities, maybe up north, even I'm talking the even as close as Thunder Bay, we have what we call secondary terminals. Now, secondary terminals are where you have large tankage sites where fuel is delivered via truck. So these trucks would pick up this fuel at a primary terminal and transport it to uh, to the secondary tankage site. And the customer will be paying for that freight premium. It, it's, it's part of why uh, the price of diesel in Timmins is always more expensive than what you'd pay for in Toronto or the GTA in general. Uh, to add to that price spread, you also have uh, the competition factor. So in Toronto, uh, in the GTA area, you have many fuel suppliers who are vying for a market share, and that competition will lead to a depressing of prices, whereas in Kenora, Thunder Bay, Red Lake, in those types of places, you have fewer, you have fewer suppliers. You may have a monopoly by one or a couple of people, and they will, you have to, to their advantage to even hike prices up and increase that freight premium. So that will explain some of the spread that you see between uh, various rack locations. So in Canada, we call them rack prices. That's the wholesale uh, price of fuel, which you'll buy from fuel, fuel supplier. And those are, that is made up of your New York Harbor price and your freight premium, as well as your fuel supplier margin. And this is, this is the same whether you have package on site or whether you're on a card lock uh, fuel purchasing agreement, your prices are built the same way. So I think this graph here looks at the Toronto rack price for diesel over the past three years. And it's a perfect illustration of how volatile prices have been and will most likely always be. So looking at the graph here, we see tail end of 2020 and the first half of 2021, prices are pretty, pretty depressed, uh, prices are pretty low. And this is as we're going through going through the worst of COVID, uh, the various lockdowns, travel restrictions, understanding fuel demand will be low. And with low demand comes lower prices. Now, you see second half of 2021, we, we start to see a rally in prices. Now, that's as more and more people became vaccinated worldwide, many governments eased their restrictions. Uh, and people start to travel more. And there was a large uptick in air travel as people were out travel, taking vacations, traveling elsewhere, as well as um, national driving across North, North America. So that explains that uptick there. Now, if you look at 2022 here on the graph, we see a, a very steep spike in prices. Now, that was precipitated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that through markets for uh, for a spin. It was, they had to digest what that meant for the oil market. Russia is one of the largest producers of crude in the world. I think they uh, amount for 13% of the world's crude. So the various embargoes and bans on Russian products, uh, especially from the West, had a massive effect on prices, especially here in Toronto, as Canada was one of those signatories not taking Russian crude. Then we see similar elevation, and we have the markets trying to digest that. We have a rise recently. We have a rally the past couple of months, and this was based on OPEC production cuts as well as economic factors. So that dip there was post-COVID as we were coming to a depressed economy. Uh, a, a depressed economy means a lower demand, and that is reflecting price as well. So I just mentioned OPEC. I'll explain who they are in later slides. And all these factors here, I'll go into depth in this presentation so we can sort of have a clear idea of what drives fuel price and how sensitive uh, it is to that combination of supply and demand considerations as well as the geopolitics of it all. Look in the next slide. 
So for 2021, we have factors here driving prices up as well as some of the factors that drove prices down. At a tail in 2020 and first half 2021, as already, as already mentioned, we saw the the worst of the COVID pandemic uh, that worked to depress prices, as you can see here, coming into our second and third waves during that period of time. Um, those travel restrictions, the lockdowns all worked in tandem to suppress uh, fuel demand. By the second half of 2021, we saw many countries relax their restrictions. People start traveling. Understandably, fuel supply goes up. Air traffic, I think, from that period from late 2020 to the first half of 2021 or even end of 2021, we had a jump of 22.4% in air traffic, um, which is massive. OPEC, who had who had initially cut supply uh, in response to that depressed demand, were now pressured to increase oil. And as they increase the production of oil, that leads to the, the falling of prices. The more oil you have in the market, the more crude, more diesel. Uh, it's just natural as a commodity that it will lead to a drop in prices. So OPEC, and now that I mentioned them, I might as well give uh, a bit of a brief explanation. So OPEC are a cartel of 13 oil producing nations who work together to influence the, uh, the global market by issuing various production quotas. Uh, they do this to make the absolute most they can, and they work uh, They work to manipulate the markets and so they can make it so much they can, producing the least amount they can. So it's it's a very delicate balancing act. You know, they, they can increase prices only so high because that will lead to a drop in demand and people just won't buy it. So it's always a, it's a precarious sort of uh, dance that they dance. Uh, together, these 13 nations, known as OPEC, uh, produce over 40% of the world's oil production. So they, they are a massive block um, and they are very significant. And markets are always looking at to OPEC meetings, to OPEC statements to try and gauge how prices will, will react to that. So that's 2021, pretty significant year. And 2022, an even more hectic year. So in 2022, the big event, as you all know, was the Russian invasion of Ukraine which triggered fuel prices to increase sharply, as we'd seen in the graph earlier in the presentation. Oil prices were rising globally even prior to the full escalation of the war, as demand rose on the back of global, global economies recovering post-COVID, coupled with low investment in the oil and gas industry. The various bans and embargoes on Russian crude and dissolutes pushed prices up even further, um, and OPEC at the same time decided to cut production uh, because of the when they cut production, now coupled with the embargoes on Russian crude, you have prices being steeply, uh, increasing steeply. Now, for some of the factors that drove prices down, sort of help balance this out, you have countries who are fearing a recession as a result of slow post-COVID recovery. Uh, those fears have always worked to ameliorate oil prices, as well as this China's sluggish recovery post COVID, the Chinese engine, the engine that is Chinese manufacturing was, was faltering, it was not starting. And China is one of the world's largest net importers of oil, has a massive influence on world fuel prices. So that was some of the factors that we looked at in 2022. So very hectic, but overall was very uh, bullish year fuel prices. Looking, to, looking at this year, so now in 2023, we have export bans by Russia to countries that imposed a price cap and a sort of a tit for tat retaliation. If it did want to move, um, just last month, on September 21st, even, there was a complete ban of gasoline and diesel exports bar for Soviet, ex Soviet nations. So Russia made a pretty drastic statement, and the markets had risen sharply on the back of that. Now, that was a very temporary ban, as just a couple of weeks later, Russia eased their restrictions um, for volumes that are sent to their port via pipeline, and as long as those volumes were to be used, half that volume is to be used for the domestic market in Russia, it was okay to be sent out. Uh, as of today, gasoline exports are still banned. So that, that's one of the a major bullish factor that we've seen the past month. We've seen Saudi Arabia, which is one of the leading nations of OPEC, 
uh, cut their production uh, by a million barrels per day until the end of the year. This is a very steep cut and it's been very bullish on prices as well. As for some of the bearish factors, some of the factors driving down feed prices, we have the Chinese, we have Chinese manufacturing just still uh, struggling. They've had consecutive months of very low productivity. Uh, they haven't managed to fully recover their manufacturing output. And this is a, a major drag on uh, on fuel prices, understandably so. We also have central banks across the world who are keeping interest rates higher for longer uh, to try and curb persistent inflation, which has been the economy uh, worldwide. Um, as they keep on increasing inflation, they keep on hurting, they keep on uh, lowering the uh, access of credit to consumers and people start spending less and that leads to a lower demand in fuel as well. People travel less, people start to save more and this has a knockdown effect across the entire economy, but especially for fuel as well. So that's what this year has been looking at and what can influence prices next year in the future. So we're gonna look at some bearish and bullish factors here. I'm loath to predict. Um, we don't predict prices, uh, how no one really knows what's gonna happen, but we can always have a, a guess of what is happening geopolitically, look at some of the supply uh, and demand considerations and sort of give our, you know, uh, sort of an educated guess into what we think might influence prices. So we're looking at uh, further Russian fuel export bans. So further bans on Russian fuel exports may take the shape or they take, 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 take the shape of what I call indirect exports, uh, whereby we have countries who are taking Russian crude and they're uh, refining them into gasoline, diesel and other distillates and selling them to Western nations. Now, since the start of the conflict, we've seen the fuel ex diesel exports of Malaysia increase massively, even though they have no, uh, no oil fields producing more volume on their soil. So they've been taking Russian crude, which is now being sold, sold as a discount. They buy it for cheap and sell to the West. So Russian crude, Russian uh, fuel is still finding its way to Western markets just via uh, different interlocutors. Now, a further fuel ban may try to tackle this issue. And if that's the case, then that's going to tighten supplies even further, which will lead to increase in fuel prices. Um, there's also the, the looming specter of further OPEC production cuts as they try to modulate their supply with what they expect the demand will be. So as mentioned, uh, there's fears of a global economic slowdown, and that slowdown is what scares OPEC or sort of informs their opinion on keeping their production slow, is to keep prices high and keep them in an advantageous position. Okay. We also have the factor of the U.S. oil inventory staying below average levels. Uh, SPR levels are very low. We have shale producers who are shutting in wells as when, whenever oil uh, prices fall, it becomes less lucrative to uh, to produce shale oil. So it's a constant yo-yo effect. And, mo and, and most recently, we have the, the uh, re-escalation of conflict between Hamas and Israel. Uh, that tragic event has thrown the entire region in, uh, has affected the stability of the entire region. It's a region that's very important to fuel, as well as Many uh, large crude oil producers are in that region. Uh, that tragedy, is a, as that tragedy unfolds, uh, we are the market is trying to digest what that means, what the implications of that uh, in, uh, conflict is uh, regionally as well as globally. So that's the effect of you know that yo-yo between supply and demand, as well as geopolit geopolitics. It's always the intersection of that where we see. Um, takes the biggest effect on our fuel prices. So for bearish factors, factors that may drive fuel prices down, we have, as previously mentioned, uh, interest rest rates being kept higher for longer by central banks. Um, as they keep inflation higher, people spend less, the demand goes down, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we have slower than expected Chinese manufacturing activity. The Chinese, are, the Chinese engine is still 
not revving at full speed, and that will work to depress prices. And we have the, a overall global recession, which I've mentioned before. So those are sort of the, the main drivers, as we know, as of today, which we expect to shape prices next year. So that's all great. But now the question back to self, what can we do to protect ourselves from all this volatility? Um, how can we stabilize fuel costs and how can we budget for fuel if it's changing every day or every hour? So one strategy, one of the best strategies, uh, only strategies to protect yourself and to give you budgetary certainty is what we call fuel hedging, also known as price lock, locked in prices, long-term locked in prices, has many names, but is also known as fuel, fuel hedging. So what is fuel hedging? Fuel hedging is a bushery tool. So it's a financial instrument that municipalities, transit operators, trucking companies, airlines, and many other fuel users around the world use to protect themselves from fuel, uh, fuel volatility. They, uh, they use it as a bushery tool, essentially. It is not necessarily the lowest price, but it is a known price. It is a line in the sand. And you, and you have used this tool to turn a the variable cost of fuel to a fixed one. Hedging providers do not supply fuel. It's a purely a financial instrument, so it's a financial transaction. Uh, we work with financial settlements, so you, nothing will change operationally. It protects against the wholesale price of fuel. So we can't, hedging does not protect you from taxes, but it does protect you from those two big factors I pointed out earlier, that uh, moving New York price, right? as well as that, what we call that freight premium. Those two factors are very volatile. They make up the bulk of your price and you can protect yourself from that by using this tool. It's very easy to administer as well. It's a fairly straightforward, easy process. So how does it work? Sorry. So the way it works is uh, the hedging provider does not purchase fuel. It's not involved in your operations in any sort of way. You'll continue same operations. You're buying from your regular fuel supplier. Uh, there's no upfront payment. So there's no premium upfront. We settle at the end of every month of the hedge period. And prices can be locked in anywhere from three months to 24 months. So it's a very, very flexible tool to use to, to in various, depending on your various needs. How's it work? So as a hedging provider, let's say Portland in this example, uh, we will work with, the, with our clients, the fuel user, and we'll guarantee, we'll sell them a rate, lock in a price. Now, at the end of the month, if that, if that customer is paid more than where we agree, where we locked in, we will credit them for every leader that they fixed with us to bring them back to that fixed cost in their budget. It goes the other way around where if the customer client had ended up paying um, less than the fixed price, they will credit Portland, they will debit us. And they'll that, that way they'll bring them back to their, their fixed rate. So it's a way of giving you complete budgetary certainty uh, using financial flows. So it's a flow of uh, financial flow done at every month, end of, end of every month. So it's a sort of Example here, in this graph here, look what that looks like. So we have in the first half of the graph, we have the average price of fuel. It goes up above the locked-in price, which is the gray line in the middle here. Then the hedging provider being Portland will pay the difference to the, to the fuel user. And again, if the average price goes down, as it's shown in the second half of the graph, uh, the, the fuel user will pay the difference to the hedging provider. I have a worked example here just to further sort of illustrate what I mean. So in this example, let's say we have a uh, Canada Transit and they want to fix a price of 100,000 liters of diesel per month. Now, Portland, we agree, a fixed, a fixed Toronto rack price of 100 cents per liter for 12 months. So it's a, it's a year hedge starting in January 20th, 2024. So 100 cents a liter, that's a, that's a dollar a buck a liter. 
Um, this is just a made up example. Prices have not been that low for many years now, so don't get too excited. Um, so, so let's say, let's look at these settlements here. So in the first case, let's say by the end of January, price increases by 10 cents. So we've agreed to a price of 100 cents per liter, and now prices have increased up to 110 cents per liter. That difference, that 10 cents, is what Portland will pay Canada Transit on the start of the next month. So starting February 1st, uh, we will pay out 10 cents times 100,000 liters that was fixed with us for an amount of $10,000 paid to Canada Transit. So that's just to sort of compensate for that extra 10 cents per liter they spent above their fixed rate. But it also goes the other way, where we have the case where Toronto rack price, the average rack price falls to 95 cents per liter. In that case, they've paid five cents less than fixed price. Uh, and that uh, Canada Transit, in that instance, will pay Portland back that five cents, so it should have been five, times 100,000. To, to, to bring them back to that that fixed price. Now, the question I get I always ask is how that average Toronto diesel price for the month calculated. Uh, that price is the monthly average of prices published on the Natural Resource Canada uh, website on NR Canada website. They post wholesale diesel prices by rack location across every location in the country, and we will take the uh, the average daily price of that and use that as our average. That way, uh, our numbers are fully transparent, can be verified by ourselves and by our clients as well. So we keep things very transparent. As you can see, very simple, uh, simple process. And this way, we, we allow our clients to have a measure of com complete budgetary strategy, if not partial, depending on how much they, of their volume that they fix with us. So why head to Portland? So what is the Portland advantage? So I want to mention that we're not the only ones offering hedging. You can always hedge uh, with your bank. Uh, the challenge being with hedging with the bank is they, they typically look at very, very large minimum volumes. Uh, Portland, we are very agile, and we can hedge as little as 10,000 meters a month. So we are very uh, flexible when it comes to hedging volumes. What we also do is we have the ability to give you a fixed rate on any rack location across the nation. So if you were to approach a bank, they'll give you a, a hedge on the New York Harbor price, on the basis price of your diesel. They don't account for that freight premium. Now, that doesn't give you full protection. That gives you maybe 80% protection or so, depending on what that freight premium is. So that freight premium, I'll just go back to the slide so I can explain a little further. That freight premium uh, varies greatly across the nation, depending on how far you are from the various terminals. Also, there's also local considerations taken into account. Uh, we have, if there's a local glut in an area, that might raise rate premium. We've had situations where we've had pipelines break down, uh, refinery shut down for maintenance, and that's led to a spike in prices in a very small locality. So maybe one city, uh, for example, maybe Edmonton will have escalated uh, elevated prices for a week or two uh, on the back of some local disturbance in their supply in their supply chain that freight premium, you'll be protected from that when you hedge uh, back to back on your uh, on your local rack. If you're only going to the bank and they're only hedging your New York Harbor price, uh, you are only protected from that, the basis movement and not so much uh, the highly volatile freight premium. So Portland, we are unique in the, in the fact that we allow you to, we can hedge your local rack. And we can hedge very, very small amounts. So we're very agile. Using this tool will give you complete budgetary certainty, no nasty surprises. It will be uh, aligned your budget and you can forget about it long in life. Uh, very simple. As I mentioned, no changes at all to your fuel operation. Your municipality or tra as a transit operator, whoever you may be, will, will continue to pur purchase fuel from neutral sources. Uh, we keep things simple. We we price on Canadian cents per liter, so you're not exposed to any currency movements. Um, mentioned very low minimum volumes, no mi real minimum volumes or periods, no upward fees. We can hedge uh, any specific fuel grade and lack location across the nation. Short, straightforward charts conditions, only 60 pages, very straightforward. And I just want to recall that uh, 
Coilin does not sell fuel. So it's a purely financial agreement. It is a financial instrument. And we are unique in offering this in this space. So I just want to thank everyone for uh, giving me the give me time and attending our, our webinar here. Um, I'm open to questions. So um. Robel, thank you. We do have a question in the chat. Um, we were asking if this would work for ESO or Shell. One of the uh, participants today says they they mostly do business with ESO for fuel. Yeah, so we we actually work with many uh, people. We work with distributors who are um, licensed ESO, ESO distributors. And that's not an issue for us. We can work with, it's a separate agreement to your fuel supplier. So we are completely separate. So you can work with Shell, ESO, PetroCanada, Suncor. It is fine. It's not an issue for for hedging. Okay, and I know you've uh, again. Anyone that um, has questions, feel free to to unmute yourself, to to raise your hand. Uh, we got the the benefit of having a, a small group here this morning. Um, we we've had um, other presentations, and people are trying to catch up and learn about the new Canadian fuel standards. Is it a, appropriate to ask you any questions about renewable diesel or is that outside of, of Portland's expertise? No, um, we actually, uh, we're, we're very involved in the uh, renewable space in, in the UK. And we also are a provider of carbon offsetting. And we also do consultancy work to sort of decarbonize how, how you would go around decarbonizing your various organizations. Um, in terms of biodiesel, we've seen great uh, innovation with the introduction of HVO in Europe, which is purely, it's a, a pure biodiesel grade. I think when it comes to the, the decarbonization agenda in Canada, something to look out for if you haven't sort of looked into it is the CFR, is the, the new carbon regulations coming in where they're looking to, in addition to imposing carbon taxes, also having uh, anyone who imports more than 400,000 liters of diesel to the country to offset by buying carbon credits and the local Canadian carbon credit space. So that's very, uh, it's, in, it's in the works, but it's very interesting in terms of what that means and implications it has for the diesel markets. I'm glad you you mentioned that. And it's good to know that Portland is another one of those uh, those companies that are that are involved in that space. I don't know if you've been uh, attending the Opta Zeb committee meetings, the topic of uh, the CFR and uh, Zeb economics is actually going to be on the agenda for the Zeb committee on Monday, so Monday, October the sixteenth, um, and we'll be looking at uh, the whole carbon credit market and and Zeb economics then. Excellent, that's a very good one to a good one to 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 attend for for everybody to really see where things are sort of moving. And what the future may look like and sort of be able to participate in that space. It's a very exciting space to participate in. Uh, carbon credits are a very live market in the, uh, in the Europe, I know for sure. I know there's a couple of interesting projects out there where people are using satellites to look for uh, green spaces in order to sort of catalog them as potential carbon reservoirs. So definitely it's the way of the future. Very interesting that, you know, when you're, when you're a transit manager, now there's just so many new new topics that you need to uh, to be aware of. Um, Absolutely. And so we we do have time. I want to encourage the um, anyone else that that has any questions. I know that um, you know I know Portland from other industries have have worked with you. I know that um, you work with the with the school bus industry, motor coach industry. Uh, I know and a couple of transit. Opta Transit members that have worked with you successfully to stabilize their their budgets around fuel. Uh, so don't want to uh, cut anyone off from from asking any other questions about any of that experience that you've had uh, in the Canadian market. Uh, I should have uh, reminded everyone as oh Brent, uh, welcome. There we go. We, we, yeah, sorry. We usually we're uh, we use Microsoft Teams here at the City of Kingston, so I'm always flip flopping between uh, the Zoom and trying to get myself unmuted, uh, exactly. et cetera. But I, I just wanted to add. So we are one of the partners, and um, that uh, that 
utilize uh, Portland. Um, so I don't know, uh, Ro Bell, it might be um, uh, good to share uh, kind of um, in our particular case, we we in order to um, to utilize uh, and and conduct fuel hedging, we 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 had to create a, a hedging policy um, uh, and work with our finance team on that. It's not a an arduous process, but I'm I'm happy to share um, to anyone that's interested on this call. Um, they can reach me what we put together, but um, uh, we did put the, that together with our finance team, which helped us kind of be able to you know execute um, agreements when when we felt uh, the need to um, based on some of the pricing pieces and and provided myself with uh, delegated authority to to execute those agreements it uh it's something you 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 want to be able to uh to uh execute in a short period of time and not wait so it is advisable to to have that in place from uh not something you'd see in the necessarily in the private sector but uh is something that that uh we've had to utilize uh from the municipal side and and that was new to me coming from the private sector because I'd done some fuel hedging before um, in some previous organizations. So I, I did want to bring that up. Um, I don't know if you need to expand on that at all, Robel, but um, I thought it important to bring up. Well, um, I just want to thank you, Brent, for, uh, for, you know, giving us that, that input. It's absolutely correct. It's uh it's, it's relatively time sensitive as anything is that's market related. You sort of need to act, you know, uh, with some sense of urgency, what we have in place to sort of get around that time sensitivity of of, uh, of of hedging is we utilize a service called open orders. So our open orders service is where we we work with our clients to uh, get a target a target price. So they may say, "Oh, I'm looking to I have a budget of this much. I'm looking to for for a certain number for diesel for this period from let's say from January to December of next year, for example." Uh, once they've given us an open order, once we have an idea of what they're looking for, uh, once they sort of uh, set up, like Brent mentioned, once the uh, the internals, uh, the, inter the, the organization's internal workings have been aligned, uh, an open order will be a very quick way of uh, executing a, a hedge without too much back and forth. We can sort of get a target beforehand and we uh, here in Portland we'll monitor the markets to see if that target is achievable and once we that tr the target is hit we we execute a, tr uh, a hedge a trade immediately thereby uh, sort of reducing some of that back and forth and some of that sort of uh, decision making sort of that sort of uh, that cycle sort of simplifies that we we found so we utilize open orders so that's one of our uh, things that we have that's unique to Portland I believe. I hope I've uh, sort of given a bit more illumination, but thank you, Brent, for uh, bringing that up. Thanks, Brendan. There, the, that offer uh, was uh, was of interest to folks, so I will uh, get that from Brent as well, and we'll make that available when uh, when members are are asking. Uh, Robel, the uh, the other thing that Opt has had in the past, we've had a procurement committee that has looked at at different products and services trying to uh, assist our, mostly our Northern members to try to help uh, with cooperative purchases. Uh, Metrolinks exists for joint procurement, but that, that committee has looked at, uh, at other things. Is there anything about hedging that lends itself to being cooperative in that way? Is there any way that that tra the transit industry as a whole could be doing to assist northern members that, that are facing these higher prices? Well, I think we can start by looking at the low lying fruit first. So part of Portland, we have our analytics wing. We work in, in fuel consultancy services. So the first thing to, is to, is to um, scrutinize these, these agreements, these purchase agreements first that they have with their various suppliers. Are they being, um, are they getting the best price? Are they uh, are they uh, well protected th through hedging? But how close are they to the market? How close are they to to the, the actual price of life price of diesel? And how close are they to the freight premium? How much margins are being made on 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 the price that they get? So I think by looking at those low, low lying fruit first, sort of looking at 
their local supply? Are they at the best price? Are they being, uh, are their fuel supplies competitive? We can sort of ameliorate some of that sort of premium that northerners pay. Um, as a whole, I think hedging, hedge, I, you can, the premium that they pay in the north is based on that freight premium because they're just far away from those primary terminals. There's, uh, unless you want to share sort of a profit loss share between the southern and northern members, I can't see how there's any way of sort of uh, closing that gap. Yeah, it's, a, it's based on the physical reality. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> Brent, I see your hand up. Sorry, I was just going to mention um, what might be uh, what might be useful. Just throwing that out there. And, and Karen, we we utilize Metrolinks for a number of of different um, procurements, primarily yes. our our transit bus purchases, but some other accessories, um, the AVL, et cetera. But um, even um, uh, even just to make them aware or send them some of the um, the the fixed price uh pricing options that that uh, that are available from portland might just educate them on kind of you know how they could how they could look at fixing their price to to maybe a, a group email um or a separate presentation but i know um on the procurement side especially for and, and you know we we still have our our own challenges with time and and trying to run rfps and stuff it, it might be raise some awareness to to even just some of the the fixed pricing that that is available even if you just did it on a trial basis uh robell and, and connor but uh, anyway i'll leave that up to you but i uh, yeah i That's think just ra ra raising awareness of that and if there is such a such a a group email or maybe it goes direct to you karen just to kind of you know uh, for we you have a know. northern uh, transit manager group that, that gets yeah, together for a bit of a lunch and learn every couple of months, trying to compare notes. And so I'm going to share that that suggestion with them. It's a great idea. And you, when we have a pricing service, I think that Brent was alluding to. Thank you, Brent, for your input mm -hmm. again, um, where we send prices almost in a daily or weekly basis, depending on what fixes you like, is to give you an idea of what the market looks like and what prices you can fix for for various different periods. So yeah, we do have a pricing service, which keeps people informed and keeps uh, hedging at the forefront of people's minds. So great so to I, know, thank you. So last call for, for questions. Uh, I know I have found this uh, very helpful. As I mentioned, we're recording here. We'll be posting it to the website. We'll post the, the slides as well. Um, uh, so we, uh, we encourage you, if you need to share this with your, your colleagues, we'll let you know as soon as we've been able to edit the, the recordings and have everything posted. Uh, so we're here at 9.45. Anyone have any last questions? Well, uh, Robel, I'm sure you're going to, to be able to provide your, um, your email. Uh, we'll yes. send that that out to everyone that's joined today and to uh, to an, uh, follow up with Opta members. Any last question? Any last comments? Well, just want to thank everyone for giving me the, um, for your time. I hope that I've managed to shed some light on the mystery that is fuel prices and what we can do to sort of protect ourselves. And if you have any question at all, uh, don't hesitate to give, give me a call or support them anytime. We can always give you um, our expertise around fuel, we are experts in all things fuel, and we are very willing to share share that. So thank you. Yes, it's really, I'll conclude it on that point. Wonderful, Robel, thank you. Um, I, so we've, noting in the in the comments there, Stephen, that's great. Um, we've, uh, I think Stephen knows how how to reach you there. Stephen, if you need any any help reaching out to our friends with uh, at Portland Fuels, uh, okay, certainly just, uh, happy to do that. I'm Thank just, you, everyone, uh, for your time this morning, uh, and uh, have a have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.